Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Hashtag Got Money. This is Elizabeth Jackson. Um, finance is a really, it's a big topic right now. And obviously, it's our go-to at Got Money. Um, and I've noticed that while we've been reporting on a kind of a total focal view about money and the landscape of money in Australia, we haven't really dug into... Um, how individual practitioners are doing. Um, and as such, I've invited Scott, who is a financial planner from Money Mechanics. Um, Scott's a financial planner. Um, he's been on Got Money before. He's our go-to guy. Um, Scott, how are you? How's everything going with COVID? Yeah, look, I, personally, I'm okay. I've um, read or, or gone through the journey pretty well. And we've been quite busy with redundancies and, and those things. And I, I, I do sort of say that in a I know, somber tone in that there are people going through really tough times at the moment, but being able to be their guiding light and stepping them through the consequence or the um, benefits or impact of their decision making, especially in the university sector at the moment, uh, we've had a few uh, clients from Qantas, uh, it's oh, it's goodness. definitely a, a tough time at the moment in, in that space. But again, being their guiding light has made it all worthwhile and sort of being able to point them in the right direction or show them some hope there. So, yeah. so explain that a little bit because you would have arranged their insurances for them. Yeah, so well, insurances, but also superannuation and um, with the redundancy process. So a lot of employers, when they're laying off staff, if they've got more than, and I don't quote me on this, I'm not an employment lawyer, but 12 staff, they have to provide a, a package or a, a severance payment. So again, some of the big employers are giving people years worth of salary or a few months worth of salary depending on the years of service so it's really decision making on right you're going to receive this lump of money what do you do with it how do you actually um, give yourself a bit of a buffer to cover your mortgage if you're still paying debt off or give yourself living expenses uh, if you're not at retirement age yet uh, on the flip side there's a few people who, who um, superannuation wise because of the nature of their super scheme they've been given additional benefits under their award or under their contract. So by getting the redundancy, they're getting an extra hundred or $200,000 in their superannuation benefit as well. So is that enough? Will they yeah. be able to retire? How does all that look? Are they actually emotionally ready to retire? I've had a client who uh, has been with a, an organization for many decades and has now been told, see you, see you later. We, we don't need you anymore. And he is at retirement age, but the actual emotional uh, adjustment and, and the ability to step through that has been really massive for him. Like the weight, like he's been in my office and pacing and all those sort of things. And just trying to get him to settle and, and be okay is, is a massive emotional journey for him. It's not about the money. It's actually about that, that other element. So, yeah. God, that's, um, that's the other side of it too. It's mental health. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, is so. Are you are you optimistic about Australia's future? At this moment in time, well, especially look, Melbourne's reopened. As, as you know, uh, I jumped between Canberra and, and Melbourne, so uh, I, I got myself stuck up in Canberra. I shouldn't, shouldn't say that. I, I was stuck in the the capital when Melbourne was in lockdown, but uh, but I had had relative freedoms. And I've been back down in Melbourne now for about a month. And so I got sort of the back end of the, the lockdown. So uh, look, I'm, I feel like the, there's a good vibe in the air in Melbourne at the moment being out and about. And I think, look, there's businesses that have been agile and they've adjusted and they've done online things or um, oh, shout out to Atlas uh, Dining and Atlas Masterclasses, if I can do that. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, go um, for but, it. Mate. But they've been delivering boxes of... Um, recipes so uh i think charlie's been on master chef and things like that but he does his little videos and you cook along with him three nights a week and uh during lockdown 1.0 that was something me and my partner were getting into and really enjoying that and it just gave us another outlet other than uh staring at each other uh between work meetings <laughs> to to do something um and do our uh, one hour of exercise outdoors um, to do something a little bit different. So it's been exciting to see those big businesses do those sort of things and the, the buzzwords of COVID being agile and, and pivoting. Um, oh, pivoting. But, oh, my yeah, God. Pivoting. Pivoting. And if I hear the word unprecedented again, I'll shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you, how do you feel about your 
your market. So uh, is there, um, are you seeing promise in the stocks and share markets again? Yeah. Look, definitely. I think there's there's always opportunity. As, as we've spoken before around the property market, look, there's different sectors and different things doing well at, at any point in time. We've obviously, at this moment in time, coming off the back of the US election. So um, with Trump, Biden, I don't know if we, we can call it yet, but um, uh, the, the market's Mark, share markets like known things because they're open between 10 and four, they're valued on a daily basis. And so um, day of election, we've seen our, our market responding. And so our market was open. The US market's been shut. So our market's been open and it's been going down today because um, of the uncertainty around who's going to be the president of the United States. But there's still going to be opportunities there. Zoom, companies like Zoom are making a truck ton of money, security, IT, companies are doing really well um, globally. And so healthcare, again, here in Australia and, and globally, CSL, companies like that are, are still going to do well. Infrastructure. And what uh, about those pay yeah. now companies? Are they, oh, well, <laughs> uh, uh, buy pay, now, pay later, after pay. Yeah, They've yeah. been doing exceptionally well too, haven't they? Yeah, look, and I mean, that, that does concern me a little bit because I guess we are still, global financial crisis happened and it was an event. We saw the I know banks of of America basically have um have credit issues and and unravel you know in a moment, but it was an event. COVID is an ongoing thing. We're starting to see the UK shut down again and Europe shut down again. Um, so we haven't got an endpoint yet. And so the thing we don't that is, know, do we? exactly, and people are losing jobs, even though the government, especially here in Australia, is throwing a lot of money at it. Um, we're going to see elements where I think um, there's uncertainty. And so those, those buy now, pay later companies do worry me a little bit because a lot of them aren't sort of, there's no full credit assessments and things like that. It then becomes a part of people's cash flow. And so if you haven't got your cash flow sorted, that can be really, yeah, really um, challenging. They're also incredibly unregulated, aren't they? Well, do, you, do, you see, um, do you see emerging uh, local markets? Uh, within the stock market uh, so are people tending to keep their money here in Australia or are they still looking for the top 20 offshore um, companies to to mm. invest their money into look I, I think um, people are getting more educated around the markets especially and uh, especially with a lot of exchange traded funds so what I mean there is managed investments listed on the share market people are doing a lot more themselves. And so I don't know the exact uh, number on it, but when COVID first happened, all these people started investing for the first time. So March this year, you'd remember, I think we were having a chat about it at the time on hashtag got money, mm -hmm. but the share market came down. And so people for the first time, oh, wow, this is okay. Let's, let's start buying into the share market. I see the risk with that because having an investment framework is really important. And a part of that investment framework is buy good quality assets but then stay the course. And when times get tough, hang on to them. The trouble when people are doing it themselves is that they don't often have someone like me in their life or, or just someone else to bounce it past to say, hey, just hang in there. I've, yeah. 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 They, yeah. they become emotionally connected to their own trades, don't they? <laughs> Exactly right. And then they'll, they'll sell. And, and I do courses. I've done a lot of on, online courses with Laneway Learning. Um, big bit of a plug out to Laneway. To, I'm plugging everybody Yeah, today. plugging everybody. Yeah, free, I, free free I love everybody. it. Get it, get um, it. <laughs> but um, we've been doing an investment course with there and had a few attendees come along. And they're like, oh, Scott, we cashed out in, in March. When do we buy back? And I'm like, yeah, that, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? When do you buy back? And so I try and say to people, don't time the market like try not to be timing the market it's about getting into the market and and again time in the market uh, as, as always mm. and we like that with property too scott it's you know i spoke to a really wealthy man um in the isle of Wight, and i said to him how do you make money in real estate and he said the only time you lose money in real estate is when you sell it mm. he said you do not yes. sell but you hold um so insurances, have you seen within your own business a lot of people making inquiry to you about upping their insurances or restabilizing their insurances? What's happening in that current marketplace? Yeah, definitely. And, and that's probably a big one because um, there's been a lot of change there. So in, in the background of the Royal Commission last year that we, uh, we all went through, 
um, we then saw APRA come in and, and income protection claims have been going up and up over a, a number of years now. So APRA has been really concerned that the insurance industry doesn't have enough reserve to actually yet continue to do that. And again, I'm probably not the, uh, the, the best to comment on all these, these elements, but um, that's actually forced insurance companies to change the type of contracts they offer. So existing contracts are fine. If you've got an income protection policy in place, you can have an agreed value contract. So it means that they'll agree to pay a set amount to you every month if you go on to claim. Um, they will also potentially pay you up to age 65. Some of the changes that they've uh, brought in is that they're limiting um, new contracts to be indemnity contracts. So basically they'll look at your last three years income and say, right, your income went down as you um, started to get sick or weren't able to work. So we're not gonna pay you that full um, insured value that you have. We're only gonna give you the 75% of your average income over the last three years. So. Um, there's little little uh, nuances like that. They're also limiting the time frame of payment. So again, instead of paying you out to age 65, they're limiting it to five years. So they'll only pay your income for five years. So what do you do after that five year time frame? And so there are strategies. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're making those noises. <laughs> yes. Jesus. Mm. And this is the deal. This is why you need somebody like Scott to help you navigate that. Do not try. Listen, what do you think of those online insurance companies? Yeah, look, I mean, look, it, it's better than not having anything. Like I, I have over my last two decades working in financial services. Yes, I, I'm still uh, holding <laughs> myself well. Yes, but good. I, I've had clients sitting in my office. I had a, a husband uh, probably about 10 years ago now in my office and his wife had died. And this is the first time I've met him. And so if it had actually been the other way around, because she thankfully had insurances built into her um, superannuation, they had two young kids. So she literally six month old kids and she would passed away. Oh and my God. I mean, you sit with that. I, I still get a bit sort of welled up thinking about it, but if it had been the other way around, he, she would have been like, stuffed yeah devastated and financially yeah. ruined exactly yeah and and there's never enough money to replace grief or to replace a partner like you, you're always going to grieve and go through that process but you don't want to have to have the financial impact and um yeah if you can at least go right the finances are okay now i can grieve yeah and, that, and that's the thing you know the life is and I guess we must know that after COVID. I mean, Jesus, mm. if we haven't got that as a nation, don't we need help? Life is really precious. But make sure that your family are taken care of, for goodness sake. If you haven't got any insurance, please ring Scott and Jolly will get some. Mm. You know, my dad did that. He sold insurance for a living. And um, I think I told you this, and I know I mention it probably at every show, but he was really upset one day. And I said to him, what's happened? And he said, he sold insurance to a couple that owned motorbikes. And I think he'd done it a week earlier or something. Mm -hmm. And they'd both been killed that day. But he'd sold them in the insurance. But he was still upset. He was upset to the loss of, for the loss of life. They'd been mm -hmm. wiped out on their motorbikes. You must have insurance for your family. If your car's insured and your house is insured, why aren't you insured? Mm, I'm talking to you out there. If you've got children or a loved one or someone that you care about, please ring Scott and get insurance immediately. I'm insured. My partner's mm. really well. She's going to have a party and take a cruise. I I've say that to my partner up. all the time. Yeah. But, but he's always going, he's like, you, you've got me well insured, haven't you? I'm like, yes, I do. Babe. Yes, I yes, do, like darling. <laughs> yes, I do. Somebody's got to have a cruise. Um, so insurance, so people are, so they're being mindful about their insurance. Yeah, look, definitely. And I think people are, again, inquiring about it, but also because premiums have been going up a lot as well. So I guess the second phase of all that, because APRA has been concerned because insurance companies are trying to readjust their, their balance sheets in that regard for claims, premiums are going up. And so people are getting their insurance renewals at the moment and going, oh, can I get a better deal? And so you can sometimes, but the, the precursor is that just be really mindful especially around that in income protection side of things that because of some of those changes the like for like comparison on the policy isn't going to be the same so um, it's just about again getting the strategy right at the end of the day and so yeah what are the so if you were to choose your insurance say you could only buy one what is it that you buy I would say for most people of, of working age it's income protection 
because okay. you want to, again, generally for most people, if you are unable to work, it will be for a short time frame. It might be for a couple of years that you're unable to, to work. If you then can't go back to work, thankfully there's NDIS, NDIA, that's like the National Disability Insurance Scheme that has been set up by, by government. And so that can be a, a, back, a backdrop to that. But that income protection and ability to continue to earn income is really important because they have limited the, the again, my, my policy at the moment has to age 65. So if anything happens to me, I keep getting paid to age 65. Because those new policies are changing, you might need to complement that with, say, a lump sum total permanent disability policy. And so I, I can't just pick one. Sorry. That's okay. So but, the... Yeah. Um, a lot of people are insured through their um, super contributions. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that just a standard? Can you just assume that you're insured or how do you, how do you navigate that space? Yeah. So that there is a government standard around, again, under insurance problem, let's have a standard to offer everybody, but you've got to check the numbers and make sure they align to you because that standard might be, oh, yep, you're in your forties, have 140,000 worth of insurance for life or TPD. If you've got a million dollar mortgage or a $800,000 mortgage, that $140,000 isn't gonna go very far. Um, so do your numbers, make sure it's your um, outcomes. Because again, a lot of these rules of averages and rules of thumb, clients are always saying to me, oh, but what's the average? What is everybody else doing? Do your plan. <laughs> Um, what, what does everybody else spend? Well, here's the average, but you don't want the average lifestyle. You want your lifestyle. So it's the same with insurances. Like how much does it cost to be you? How much do you need still coming in if you or your partner weren't there? Or if you don't have a partner, if you weren't able to do stuff anymore, how much money do you need coming in? And keep in mind, there is a safety net with Centrelink, but that only goes so far. I think the disability um, uh, payment from Centrelink is about $28,000 a year for a single person. Now, um, like, yeah, Elizabeth. Oh, yes. Hmm. So it seems like it's quite limited. Hmm. Exactly. Like right. I did that. Um, within your business right now, when mm. people come and see you, it's it's is it straight into insurance? What do you start looking at initially? Well, we we step back from all. So it's all about outcome base. So I often say to people, well, let's actually take all this back. So financial triage, people will, will roll into my office because they want to talk about insurance or they want to chat about their cash flow or their, oh, we've got this investment property. Is it doing any good? We've got a share portfolio. We've got superannuation. But that's the financial triage. That's the thing that's gone, right, we're rocking up. We've got to get this patched up. But what I like to do is is address that and, and get that all wrapped up and say, right, okay, you, you feel okay and content with whatever that is. But now let's take the step back and look at the, the bigger picture because financial planning is all about having a decision-making framework around your money. You don't need someone like me for that. So Elizabeth, you can have a financial plan without having a financial planner. It is just your and your partner's decision-making framework around money. And so it's about stepping through that process and saying, right, what are your ideal life outcomes? What are you trying to achieve? What's the game plan? Why have you got the investment property? Why have you got yeah, the why insurances? Have you got the, why, why have you, why, why, why? Why, yeah, yeah, why, yeah. Have you, why have you got the superannuation? Why is your, your superannuation invested that way? What's important to you? I've, I've had clients over the years who are like, oh, we're really into renewable energy and we want to make sure we're not um, just like investing in companies that are destroying um uh, things don't want to give bad raps to companies. I like how you did that. You just pulled um, it back. Uh, like, destroying really? things. Yeah. Things, yes. Destroying uh, amazing um, stuff. Historical yes. things. Um, but you can actually have decisions about that. So if your super isn't aligned to those values, let's get your super aligned to those values. If that's important, like, let's actually make sure that that's that's aligned. If you've got an investment property, is it about capital growth long term? Is it about an income play? Like where does it fit into your overall? financial decision-making framework. And so it, it is about, as I say, addressing the financial triage, but then looking at that, that bigger picture of what is the context of this? Where does this fit in? Because there's always going to be different touch points where those decisions come up in that you might need to look at your insurances again, or you've paid the mortgages out on all your investment properties, or you're about to retire, or you've lost your job because of redundancy. It's all about then just resetting and saying, right, well, here's my framework. 
that framework shouldn't change too much. It's just about it making those adjustments as you need to. It's necessary to kind of, because everybody has different um, risk profiles as we grow up, right? As we mm. go through. So I've got a young niece and her risk profile is 100%. She wants to risk everything. But as you get older, your risk profile kind of just dampens down a little bit. Do you help clients do that on the way through their, their, their journey into retirement? Do you, or are you constantly tweaking their risk um, appetite? Yeah, look, definitely. And, and again, it, it depends is my big answer in, in regards to risk profiling. But the, again, it's about looking at that because when we risk profile clients, we'll say, have you ever borrowed money for investment before? Oh, yes. And then you have a conversation. Oh, no, I'm really conservative, Scott. Whereas someone else might see and hear, oh, I've borrowed money to invest and go, ooh, that's, that's high risk. And so it is all about, again, the emotional heart-based stuff around the money and just saying right well what is your what is your risk tolerance like i love how you what does did that, that mean it. i love so, how you did that your heart-based tolerance well, i it, love that you did it that is. It's, it's it's from here like we financial planners we always get pulled into our, our heads because that's where financial planners traditionally are so comfortable we love to go oh yes let's talk about analytics and rah 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 rah, rah. but that's not how i'm like we don't deal at a human level money is a means to an end and, and a fuel in our vehicle. And so, and when we connect with the heart-based stuff, that's where it actually starts to give us context and that value. Because if we give you a plan, Elizabeth, that's not aligned to that, how far do you think that plan's going to go? Oh, it'll die. You, do you know what? What a, mm. what a just a beautiful statement. Because that gets lost, doesn't it? People, you're right. Mm. There, there, there is those that are so analytical that forget that what sits behind that is a human being that has mm. needs and, and, and wants outcomes. And usually because they're emotionally connected to these other people. Um, thank you for joining me on Got Money, mate. Amazing having you back on the show and Always back down from Canberra, joining us down here in Melbourne. We're all allowed haircuts now. Good to yeah. see you. How do our listeners get hold of you? Um, so we're on Insta, Instagram and Twitter as my uh, favoured uh, social media. So all at Money Mechanics. So all one word, Money Mechanics. And our website is www.moneymechanics.com.au. Thank you, darling. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to thank all of the Joy volunteers that are out there working away and, and those that go into the studio to make us able to actually bring our shows to you while we're working remotely. I thank you. I acknowledge you. I appreciate what you do for us. Um, to the team that make our show possible, thank you for all of your hard work. Take care, everyone. Be safe. And we look forward to hanging out with you again next week.